so I'm just going to do a super fast recap. And I know for those of you who've been with us for uh, the whole, um, you know, five weeks prior to today, uh, a lot of this will be quite familiar. But for those who haven't been, this is just what we've covered. And again, if you have, you know, hear something or you want to know more about something, remember that the video recordings of these are all available through our Slack channel and if you're not in that be sure to contact David just send him a quick chat message now and he can invite you into that group so that you can catch up on that so we do uh, have the recordings of this and also our mentor panel sessions where we then further discussed each of those topics so just a, a, a quick recap so that we can jump into today's topic as well so we looked at the Lean Canvas, which is a great tool when you're starting out to see where your gaps are and what you think you know about various aspects of what will potentially become your new business. It's also a really good tool to continue using. It's always good to have it as a live document that you're working on, particularly as you discover what's valid and not valid. And to do that, we like to use a validation board, which helps us work through the different stages of creating hypothesis around who our customer is and what problem we believe they have and then eventually moving through into the various solution hypotheses that we'll work through as we start to discover what people actually want to use and what they'll pay for and creating our list of assumptions of what we believe to be true and working out how we can test that as quickly and cheaply as possible and thoroughly. So we want to do that because we don't want to build something that nobody wants. And when we say wants, has a willingness and capacity to pay for in addition to actually wanting the technology or the, the product or the service. Uh, it doesn't always work hand in hand, unfortunately. So sometimes we want things, but we won't pay for them. So we need to find a business model that does both. To do that, we want to make sure that we're talking to the right people and that's not just the person who will pay for the product or the person who will use the product. They're both very, very important, but also the person who decides whether that's what they're going to acquire and also those who influence others. And that can happen in both a positive and negative way. So being aware of that and knowing who we're playing with and making sure that we're understanding what's the problem that they each have, because even though our solution may end up being the same, the way they think about the problem can be very, very different. And we wanna make sure we're speaking the right language to the right person. So knowing who our ideal customer is, is also very important in the early stages of our journey because we only have so much time and energy and resources to spend. We want to make sure that we're talking to the person that's going to give us the best bang for buck and that someone who cares about the problem is looking for a solution, willing and able to pay, uh, that you've got access to and that is potentially still willing to help you design a solution if you're in those very early stages of solution development. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, making sure that we understand what that customer is doing, what their job is, the what problems they have, and what they're looking to achieve from doing that job is important because then as we develop our solution and we're talking about it, we can help connect the dots, marry up what features of our product help them actually solve that problem or what features of our product help them create that ultimate goal that they're looking to achieve. And we can talk about that, but also making sure that we're only focusing on developing the parts of it that are going to actually help, uh, help the customer do what they need to do because we want to create something that's going to be viable in the long term and we can't build every bell and whistle in it from the beginning. So we want to focus on the things that are most meaningful, um, but making sure that we're not just building something that's functional and is not very nice to use or engage with. We want to make sure we've got that nice wedge of the pie, making sure it does its job, feels good, looks good, smells good, tastes good, fits the price point, and then gradually build out what it can do from there. Thinking about our business model is also really important. And nowadays with the benefits of technology, we've got so much more scope of how we can create our business to be sustainable, but also diverse and looking at different ways that we can engage with our customers, what services and products we can provide and how we do that is important in the early stages of your journey because what you think a customer may pay for, uh, they may not, but they may actually pay for something that works alongside of that and that could become the most critical part of your business model going forward. Uh, so lots of discovery to be had there as to what will work for you. 
And then the more diverse your revenue streams can be, the better. So if you're only seeking income or revenue from one particular thing and then it stops, uh, your business is in strife. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of that at the moment with businesses that cannot adapt uh, their business model and their service delivery for their customers during this time of quarantine, pandemic, whatever we'd like to call it. So looking for you know, diverse uh, revenue within your business can definitely help your business be more sustainable, not only through times of pandemic, uh, but drought, legislative changes, just cultural shift of what people want to do and how they want to engage. Obviously, you're looking not just to provide a product or solution for your customer, but you want to build your business out to be a strong business that can be saleable at the end of the day as well. Generally, that's our goal for us. We want to be able to uh, you know, list it or sell it, whatever that could be. So making sure that we're actually thinking about the business that we're building in addition to the product or service uh, that we're, we're providing. So are you thinking about how you're represented with your brand, how you're connected to your market, as well as your product? What systems have you got in place? What policies, um, processes? How the culture of your organisation is developing, particularly from the beginning as you're bringing people into your team, and also how you can access funding. Of course, with customers, we do want to get them, but we want to keep them and grow them. So looking at our pirate metrics is also important and making sure that your strategy includes not just getting that customer in the first instance, but how you manage to uh, engage them, get them using your product on a regular basis, coming back and buying it again, but introducing their family, friends, colleagues, business partners, whoever that might be, and of course, paying. So when we're looking at our audience, we want to make sure that we've got a method of tracking them through the various stages and knowing that we're engaging with them in the right way in those early stages of making them aware of us and us becoming aware of them, capturing their details so we can generate uh, the right sequence of events that's going to happen with that particular organisation and or person uh, or organisations are made of people. So making sure that we've got the right process there to confirm their interest, work through them, making the decision, and then obviously fulfil our commitment by taking action at the end. And that may look like how we communicate and market to them and giving them information in the beginning, some sort of sample way of engaging with us to build that uh, level of trust that they have with us and then obviously providing the product but not stopping there, making sure we're thinking about what they need next or in conjunction with the, the purchase of our product to fulfil that job that they're trying to do. And that can look at, <clears throat> excuse me, partnering with other organisations sometimes that are already providing a different product or service that will tie in quite nicely and you may be able to generate revenue through that relationship as well. Of course, we want to make sure we're crossing all our T's and dotting all our I's. So looking at some of those big questions that are going to position us in a way that's going to ensure our business is strong and safe, both for us as the business owners, for our employees, our customers and our partners through the entire process. So looking at what legal requirements we have, as well as health and safety, you know, all of that. So a few questions there to work through. But of course, we can't do everything necessarily on day one. So really thinking about what's the most important and what has you know, the most chance of happening and what's going to create the biggest impact. And are we prepared for that and know what to do in that situation when it arises? Or is it something we just need to be aware of because it's probably unlikely to happen. And if it does happen, it's not going to create much of an impact on our business anyway. The next part was talking through negotiating and having conversations with potential customers often requires a lot of negotiation when we're in the early stages of developing our business. We wanna make sure that we're uh, not being unfairly treated because we're new or small. Uh, we wanna make sure that we stand our ground where required, but of course we want a win-win outcome at the end of the day for our customer and ourselves. So understanding what that looks like, how to position yourself to have those conversations, how to prepare mentally for those conversations, as well as financially and logistically. So all of that needs to come together and make sure that at the end of the day, you're getting something that's good for you and good for your customer as well. And of course, 
we want to make money at the end of the day as well. We don't want to, uh, generally, in this sector, we don't want to be creating a charity. So we want to make sure that we're going to have the money we need to do what we need to do. And often that will require either borrowing or seeking investment. So understanding the whole process that we go through of income and expenses, what your burn rate is, how much it costs you to acquire a customer, how much you can earn from that customer over your lifetime relationship with them, what it's going to cost you to establish yourself in the market and also what it's going to cost you to produce your product or service. So all of those things come into play and at the end of the day, if you don't have the cash to do that, you need to look at avenues to raise those funds and obviously investment is something that a lot of people look at. Not everybody though, so deciding whether that's right for you, but if it is, knowing why you need that money, what you're going to do with it and what commitment you're prepared to give. So what are you going to do in exchange for those funds is important. Lots of different ways to find funds. So obviously making sales from customers is usually our preference. If you can raise the money from the people who actually want your product, that's great. Uh, but if not, then borrowing, bootstrapping, seeking investment. Uh, there was a little conversation before we started today around some grants that are available in different sectors. Uh, so Nira have obviously got some, some grants open and opening and lots of other methods as well, particularly through government. And Melissa's not with us yet today, but uh, she's obviously across a lot of that as well and in, um, in that space too. So looking at all of those different places where you can find funds is important and doing it well ahead of time. You don't want to need it tomorrow and be seeking it today. You want to be thinking in advance and preparing. And then brand. So when we're building our brand, and this conversation was quite interesting uh, to, to go through, that often we don't always really think of what a brand necessarily means to our customer. We think of it from our side, but we really need to think about it from our customer's side because that is what counts. If they don't see you the way you want to be seen, uh, then there's, there's a misalignment there. So understanding what it is for you, putting that out as best you can, but seeking feedback on it is really important and knowing that it extends through your entire organisation, not just yourself, but it starts with you. So making sure that it's, you know, you are your brand as well and you have your own personal brand. So more than just your logo, more than your name, but in your messaging, in your culture and, and in your product too. Brand obviously is something that you can build in terms of value. So where we talked a little bit before about what are you wanting to sell at the end of the day, it's probably your business as well as you know, your product in between times, but have you got a brand to sell? Is that actually going to be worth something and how are you building that quite intentionally is important. And for yourself, so becoming known and trusted. And we, we know ourselves that we like to do business with people that we know, like and trust. If we don't like somebody, we'll usually look for an alternative. Who else can I deal with that's not, you know, a complete dick? So I just want to make sure that when I go to work in, in the day, I'm dealing with people that I enjoy spending time with and that results um, generally with my customers as well. So are you, are you being intentional about that? And are you putting that vibe out for other people to see that about you? Are, they, are you giving them the opportunity to get to know you, to like you, to trust you as being, you know, you might not be the world's greatest expert in your field yet, but you're sharing what you know and showing that you are always learning, which is important as well. And thinking outside the square is all about making sure that you're not just focusing on your customers, but connecting in with your industry, which is super important. And the fact that you're all here and you're getting to know each other is a great step in that regard. But putting yourself in a position of being able to meet with people. Um, we had an interesting conversation again with Abby and Ben yesterday about the fact that, you know, the, the CEOs of mining companies are still people. Um, they have families, they care about things. Yes, they want to make a profit for their business, but they're still people at the end of the day. And you can chat to them um, and often quite more openly than you think, uh, you know, people can be quite more accessible than you might think they are. So, so not being afraid to initiate a conversation or, or go up to somebody at a networking event and, well, at the moment you're not allowed to shake hands, but generally shaking their hand and introducing yourself and getting to know them a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, you, you fit into that whole mould of the industry. 
and being findable as well. And I expect that if I go searching for you all today, you've all got LinkedIn profiles now. So um, <laughs> feel free to reach out and connect with me uh, on LinkedIn, but be, be findable. Make sure that anyone who wants to find you can find you. Uh, as far as marketing goes, we talked a bit more about marketing and making sure that your marketing message aligns with what you've learned about your audience. What are they trying to do? What are those pain points? And what do they want that end picture to look like? And does your marketing message actually reflect that? Are you showing that you can help them achieve what it is that they want to achieve and engaging them in that process? Making sure you're creating useful content. So don't just you know, chuck stuff out there for the sake of getting something up, make sure it's actually useful. So whether it's a written thing like a blog or a book, um, whether it's instructional, it's helping people learn how to use your product, lots of how to's, checklists and uh, those sorts of things, but also recommendations and introductions can be really useful content as well. And just answering people's questions um, can be particularly helpful, whether it's in online forums or, you know, on a Zoom call or whatever it might be. So all of that. There's lots of different platforms that are available, all the social media ones, of course, but it's finding where your audience is. Uh, rather than trying to drag them somewhere, go to where they are. If they listen to podcasts, you know, be a guest on a podcast. If they read magazines, put something into a magazine. You know, if they watch the television, try and get yourself on television. And, you know, go where they are. Don't, don't pull them uh, the other way. But again, make sure that with anything that you're doing, you're putting yourself in a position of being able to initiate a conversation. You want people to be able to connect with you and ask you more questions because obviously you can't share everything in one article. Which brings us to pitching, which is initiating a conversation. So we are going to hear a little bit from you all shortly, uh, but something that I wanted to do is just run through a couple of different uh, pitching, um, I guess, concepts. And when we're talking about pitching for next week for demo day, we're talking about, you know, a five minute prepared pitch. Uh, almost like a speech, but not quite, but you know, you've, you've got a script for it, you know what you're going to say in advance, you've practiced, 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 you've got some great pictures to accompany that message, uh, it's, it's curated and everyone's going to be listening to you. But pitching otherwise is often based on, I've bumped into you somewhere and I want to know more about you and I may be meeting you for the first time or perhaps I've met you before. But it's those first encounters that we want to make sure we're sharing as, uh, I guess, a, an interesting message as we can in a very short space of time. Because if the person you're talking to isn't interested, you just move on. But if they are interested, you want to make sure that what you're saying is going to peak enough for them to start to engage in a conversation with you, which will allow you to share more details later at an appropriate time. And that could be like right then it might go further or it might be you know give me your business card send me an email let's connect and and see what comes from that so you're always gauging that conversation based on the situation and obviously if you're literally in an elevator you may only have 30 or 60 seconds and then you're going to get out of that elevator and go wherever you are going however if it's a networking event maybe you've got a little bit more time but you don't usually want to be stuck talking to one person the entire night you do want to go around and meet a few a few people but you want to make sure that that bond that you create with somebody is strong enough that when you then go back to them to talk to them again the next time they remember you and they understand why so the different types of pitches that we normally talk about, elevator pitches or gaddy pitch is the concept that we like to use. It's a nice simple model, a high level value proposition pitch, an invest pitch and a demonstration or competition pitch. So I'm gonna go through the first two of these uh, which we haven't covered before and then I'm gonna to briefly touch on the demonstration one. Uh, I'm not gonna cover an investor pitch. It's, it is a different, Thing. Um, so if you're looking for investment, uh, you know, we can talk about that afterward. But yeah, it's a different process. So for today, I just want to cover the first two and then we're going to briefly touch on the demo one again uh, before we jump into some conversations with our mentors who I see are starting to join us. So thanks guys for coming in. 
So with a Gaddy pitch, I'm just going to, I just need a wave. I can see you all on my screen over here. Um, who feels comfortable that they have an elevator pitch like that, you know, 15 to 30 second pitch. So just pop your hand up if you feel I have an elevator pitch ready to go. Okay, so can't see all of you because some of you don't have video, but from the others, about half. All right. So this particular one, being a Gaddy pitch, is generally something that if you can have it prepared as an initial response, that if you meet someone and they say, what do you do? You don't say, and like with my former hat on, you know, I'm an accountant. Like, you don't say that because that's boring as that shit and nobody wants, to, nobody cares. They're probably going to walk away from you um, if you just give them your job title. They want to know what do you do? You know, what, what do you actually do? So this is a nice little way. And again, the words, you make them your own, but it's along the lines of, well, you know how this customer, this person, you describe who they are um, and what their problem is. So this customer has this problem. Well, what we do is... And then you talk about the benefit or the feelings that that person enjoys when they've used your solution or while they're using your solution, depending on what your solution is. And then if you can give just a very short, you know, testimonial, a little case study, a story about what you've done for someone in particular. And this all fits inside like 30 seconds. So it's something, again, that you know how to say, you're quite practised at it, it rolls off the tongue. It's words that sound like you, okay, because what I'm going to say sounds like me, but you make it sound like you so that it feels good and it feels comfortable. And again, that it's not too long because this is just someone saying, hey, what do you do? And then you can tell them. So this is just a little example. So you know how working parents struggle to find the time to plan healthy, nutritious meals during the week. Well, what we do is plan for them, delivering farm fresh ingredients for each meal with an easy to follow recipe that's low in sugar and carbs and takes less than 30 minutes to prepare. In fact, just last week, we had one dad tell us that he now enjoys spending time in the kitchen with his kids, teaching them how to cook and chatting about their day. I could have said, I'm a chef or I make food boxes or something. So it's, that's the difference. So it's giving some emotion to it uh, at a level that works for your audience. Of course, you, you're always considering who your audience is. So with that, when you're creating a, you know, an intro or an elevator pitch, um, it is meant to be passionate and inspiring. You're meant to be excited about what you do. You're meant to enjoy the fact that you do whatever you do every day. But it is not a sales pitch. You are not selling them anything. You don't have to talk about what your product is called. You don't have to talk about the name of your business. They didn't ask that. They asked, what do you do? So tell them what you do. I help people do this. So making that up, you know, something that, that sounds right for you is really important. But please don't try and pitch someone to sell them something when they've just asked, what do you do? Okay, that will come later, but you want them to like you first. And they'll usually like you if they know that you're passionate and inspiring about what you're actually doing. And again, your personality has to fit in there and so does your audience. So yeah, make, make that work for you. So just to recap on that, it's usually something along the lines of, you know how, and then you talk, describe the customer, describe the problem that that customer has, talk about the benefits and feelings, that they encounter and a little of your solution, not, you know, not all of it, just a little of your solution and then a little story, okay, of how you've helped somebody or what you've done, an example there. So do we get that? Does that sort of make sense? A couple of nods? Yep, cool. Alrighty. So the next one, and normally I'd workshop this and I'd hear from you all, but I realise we don't have a lot of time right now, so we're going to move on to the next one. So the next one is a little bit more information. So this is a higher level value proposition. So this is tying in what we've learned about our customers' pain points and what they want to achieve and the job that they're doing. So from our canvas that's got the circle on one side and the square on the other side, so we're using this sort of information. And this could be basically the next thing that you say to somebody if they're like, well, that sounds really interesting. Tell me more about that. So then, you know, this might be the next thing that you say, either right then or you know, at a later stage or if people are asking more about it. So our, you know, product or service, whatever that might be, helps. And again, remind them who that 
ideal customer segment is. So again, it could be describing the exact person or a type of business or someone within a business. Um, who want to and what's the job again that that person's doing? So before we talked about the problem because we were highlighting perhaps that pain point, but now we're talking about the job. What is it that they're trying to achieve? And then we're going to help them do that by removing a pain point. So we're addressing the fact that we know this is a problem for this person and we're providing or building Again, you add your own descriptive words there, but what is it they want to achieve? Why are they doing that job? What's that gain that they're looking for from having done that job and done it well? And then you can add an unlike, now I'm not saying here to bag out the competition or highlight you know, the, the things that are your opinion about um, your competitors, but it could be about the current solution that that person is likely to be engaging with or the current options that are available that there might be a shortcoming to. And this is where you're basically highlighting your uniqueness. What's your point of difference? Uh, because there may people might go, oh, well, don't they already do X? And it's like, well, yes, but, you know, this, this is how we're better. This just gives you the opportunity to include that right right in the beginning in the value proposition. So um, it's kind of like calling out the elephant in the room sometimes in, in making it upfront. But again, don't put yourself in a position where you're saying something really awful about somebody. That's not what it's about. It's just highlighting that point of difference. So we wanna make sure that that feels good as well. So an example of that one, and I've used Dave's business for this one. So our still products and accessories website, shedblog.com.au, helps homeowners and builders who want to renovate, repair, extend or improve a steel building by removing the challenge of finding someone to help with their small job and providing detailed information and access to individual components which can be ordered online and delivered to site, unlike new shared retailers who are only interested in selling them a whole new shed. So again, it's just breaking it down and saying, we know who we're talking about, we know who we're helping, we know what they're helping them do, and similarly, we know how we're different. Um, so crafting something like that for yourself allows you just to be able to move that conversation forward with someone who's interested. You wouldn't necessarily lead with this because they don't know anything about you necessarily. So lead with your gaddy, little elevator pitch, and then, um, and then you could go to something like this. So do we get that? Do we understand the difference there? Yep. Okay. All right, and then of course, uh, we come to something like our, our demo or competition pitch. And in this, because you've got an audience listening to you, but not necessarily able to engage with you right in that moment. So the other ones are designed on, I've met someone at an event, at a barbecue, whatever, and I'm just chatting to them, and maybe there's a couple of people, but you know, it's quite personal, and I expect an immediate response. Um, you know, when I've said something that they're gonna, they're gonna give me their feedback straight away. Here, this is, it's delayed. So you're, you're going to tell your story. You may have a couple of people who are there allowed to ask you questions, but the rest of the audience are literally just listening and you want them to come talk to you later. You want them to remember you. You want them to know what you're doing, uh, to decide whether they feel that they're, you know, a good fit for what you do and interested and able to help you in some way and knowing how they can help you is really important. So knowing why are you pitching, what are you asking for, and it doesn't have to be money, and please don't, don't make it money. It's, it's not, the, it's not the, um, the setting for that. Um, when you hear pitches at a demo day and they're saying, we're seeking $250,000 for 5% of our business, it just, it's off-putting generally for most people. Um, you know, you can have that conversation later. Just get people engaged in what you're doing and want to come talk to you to find out more. Um, if you are at the point of raising, obviously, you know, you might mention that, but you don't have to give the specifics there. But what you may be able to talk about is, you know, if you're looking for a pilot, you know, we're looking for companies that fit this, you know, whatever it is, um, so that we can run a pilot and we can give them, you know, the data or, or whatever, okay? It depends on what you're doing. So you can definitely talk about that. Um, strongly recommend that you've scripted it and practiced. Can't recommend that enough to feel really confident in your delivery. 
Next week it will be pre-recorded, so we'll get you to record the video just so we don't have technical difficulties on the day, but often your demo day or competition pitch will be live, so you do need to have practiced it. You don't really want to be standing there with a piece of paper reading it if you can avoid that at all. Um, so the more you practice, the better, and obviously getting feedback ahead of time. And usually something like your demo or competition pitch you'll continue to develop, so you won't just create it for this one demo day. You'll continue to develop it as your business grows and develops and you learn more about your customers and obviously what you need might change. So be regularly practicing and seeking that feedback around how it's received, because if you're pitching and you're not getting the outcome you're looking for, perhaps your message or your delivery isn't quite hitting its mark. So that feedback is really important. And the final thing there is, to be yourself and tell a story. You do want to engage someone in the journey that you're taking your customer through, but it's not a play, okay? Don't be an actor, still be yourself. It's always super important. So these ones I shared last week, so I'm just gonna to touch really, really quickly on them. Um, when you're preparing your pitch, use as few words as possible. Please don't show me a slide that looks like what you're seeing right now, okay? This is, a, this is an educational session of content. It's not a pitch. So I don't wanna see a slide full of words that you think your audience is going to read. I wanna see a nice picture that's going to match up with the words that I'm using, but I don't want those words to be super complex and long, okay? If you can say it in three words, say it in three words, not 30. Also keep it fairly simple. And I know I've had this conversation with a couple of you around the fact that you know, you're know you inviting certain people and you want them in the audience and you wanna be talking to them. And that's fine. I still encourage you not to use jargon and don't use anything that's too complex because you never know the level of that person uh, understanding anyway. And they might use different words to what you use. Um, if you haven't met them and you don't know them really well already and ideally, you know, you're pitching to, to new people. So don't assume their level of knowledge is as high as yours even or higher. Um, so keep it, keep it simple. Don't say something is a fact if you're not certain that it's a fact, okay? And the other thing is to practice out loud. It's much harder to say words together than it is to read them in your head. So we can often read things in our head, no problem, but once we actually have to try and get our tongue and teeth and lips and everything to go in the right order to say those words out loud, it can be quite difficult. So please practice out loud saying what you've actually written down. I recommend recording it, listening it back, making sure I do it all the time. I leave words out. You probably notice because you're talking and listening to me. But, uh, you know, you, your brain works at a certain level and your mouth doesn't always keep up and it might skip a word every now and again. So make sure you're listening so that you know, what am I actually saying? Am I getting all of those words in? Am I pausing in the right place to give the emphasis where it needs to be? Have I got some intonation and some tone in there to say I'm excited about this or this is a real problem? You know, uh, is that happening? And the other thing, if you can practice with someone who doesn't know your business well, that is really important as well because the audience isn't going to know your business. And if you're uh, only practicing with people who already know your business well, they're going to fill in the blanks of what they know already, even if you're not saying it, a new audience won't be able to do that because they just don't know. So you want to make sure that wherever possible you can practice. And today, you've got a few mentors here that you can practice with, which is awesome. Uh, so, so just finally, you know, write the script, practice it, um, yeah, all pretty much the same things there. It's good to have a hook and tell a story. And if you watched any of the videos that I shared in the Slack channel of some examples of demo day pitches, you'll notice that the ones that uh, I shared, most of them, not all of them, but most of them had a story that engaged you in the journey of the customer. So keep that in mind as well. And again, it's got to fit for you and work for you. But if you can lead someone through this journey with you, it's much more um, enjoyable as a listener and also easy to understand where it's going and what's happening as opposed to if it's all quite just theoretical and not personalised at all. So a few um, slides to, 
to uh, include. You don't have to put them all in. It's not a rule book. You don't have to follow it in this order necessarily, but it is a tried and tested model that generally works. So it's a good place to start if you don't have something already. Talking about the problem, the customer, how you're going to access those customers is really important as well. So how you'll find them or how they can find you, but generally in this case, it's how you'll find them, how you'll engage, what the solution is. And again, how much of the secret sauce you give away is up to you, but talking about, you know, this is what we'll do how you're different, okay, that uniqueness of your value proposition, how you actually match your solution, the features of your product or service to those pain points that your customer has and talk about that, those things marrying together and what that end position looks like. How big is your market? And how are you going to work out what you need to do to be viable to start with and then to be able to scale? Lots of people can create a small business. Okay, and a lot of people only want to create a small business, but if your intention is to scale, and particularly if you think you're going to be seeking investment funds at some point in the future, you've got to be able to show how you expect to be able to scale your operations beyond your own self and your own time. So think about that as well. Uh, your strategy to be profitable and sustainable. So again, often new businesses are not profitable at the beginning, okay? It costs a lot to get started, a lot of capital required, a lot of investment in those initial years, but eventually you do wanna be profitable and then obviously sustainable and you know, growth becomes part of that as well. But have you actually thought about that and what does that look like? And it can be offering you know, a product or a service at the beginning, and then you know expanding more but looking almost at that mvp sometimes and then what comes beyond that the other thing that i encourage you to talk about is your team and you know if you're currently a team of one i get that uh, but you've probably got advisors or other businesses that you're working with and people around you uh, that are helping support you on this journey so recognizing them but certainly if you have a team what are the strengths of your team that you each bring your experience? Um, sometimes it's your character as well that comes into that. Who else is supporting you? So that extends a little bit further, but if you've already got customers, if you've got runs on the board, you've got you know, partners or you've already raised some funds, um, and if you're allowed, um, then talking about those. And again, we don't need to know a full list of every customer you've dealt with, but highlighting the ones that you think are impactful as far as other people knowing uh, that you do what you say you're going to do. And then, you know, what are you asking for? So is it an introduction? Is it, um, you know, a, a, yeah, whatever, you know, what, what's important to you? And then how can anyone listening connect with you afterward? Um, and obviously, you know, on the session, if they're live on the session, we'll have some opportunity for them to, to move through breakout rooms talking to you, um, but your contact details, can they email you, can they phone you, can they find you on LinkedIn, you know, where, where do you want them or a website, something like that. So, I've gone two minutes over today, but we're there. So, I think all of our mentors have joined us now. So what we might do is just take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll jump into our panel session to discuss this further. So get up, stretch, refill your water bottle, go to the bathroom, whatever you need to do. So we'll come back at uh, as quick as we can, but say, you know, by about sort of uh, seven past 10 and then we'll jump straight into our panel.